Acts chapter 9, and uh, praise the Lord for Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord for the hope that He gives us this morning. Praise the Lord for the victory that He gives us this morning. Praise the Lord that no matter what you're going through or what you're facing this morning, and as dark as a day may seem, as hopeless as a situation may seem, you can find a way through Jesus Christ. And there's just something about that name. Praise the Lord for that. Acts chapter 9 in your Bibles. We just read there a few moments ago the testimony of Saul of Tarsus, as the Bible tells us his name, later to be known upon his conversion as Paul. And as I mentioned, the Apostle Paul is arguably the greatest Christian to ever live. Through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Paul wrote 14 books, 14 books out of the 66 books of the Bible that we read and study today. Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, 1st Timothy, 2nd Timothy, Titus, Philemon, and Hebrews. It's safe to say that he remains one of the most read authors in human history. Think about that. But, as we read here in Acts chapter 9... Before he was the greatest Christian arguably to ever live and the author of scripture of 14 books of the Bible, he was known here as Saul of Tarsus. And as we study scripture, we understand that Saul was against God. Saul did not believe in the Messiah, Jesus Christ. In fact, he was so bent against uh, Christ's downfall and the gospel movement that when you read the book of Acts, you understand to Paul's own testimony, his own words, he ravaged the church. He would enter the homes of believers and commit them to prison for following the ways of Christ. His anti-Christian zeal motivated him not only to arrest and imprison the husbands, the dads of the families, but... He was also locking up the wives as well. Everyone that he could that professed Christ, we read in Acts chapter 8, you can look for yourself, he would go around with the mission to destroy them, to lock them up, and to discourage them from following Christ. He was a murderer. He was very well, most theologians believe that he was there during the stoning of Stephen early on in Acts, one of the first, the first deacon of the church. He was there for the stoning. It was his passion. He was a murderer. He was an enemy of God. But something happened in Saul's life. And he tells us about it here in his own words in Acts chapter 9. Now, we read, and we just read in those few verses, that here is Saul, and he's on his way to Damascus, the Bible says. Now, non-biblical historical sources reveal that the Jerusalem leadership had determined that Christianity should not gain a foothold in Damascus because it was a major hub at the time. And from there, they believed the gospel could spread really quickly throughout the known world. And so Paul's on his way to Damascus to discourage Christians from spreading the gospel, to imprison them, and if needed, to stone them. Acts chapter 9, verse 1, we read it right there. It says, And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciple." That the disciples, that phrase in Hebrew, one that breathes out violence or cruelty, it just shows Paul's inward uh, disposition. The rage, the wrath, the malice, the envy, the bloodthirstiness to destroy and persecute Christians. But then in verse 4, something happens that day that Saul was not expecting. As he journeyed down this road to this city of Damascus with a mission to persecute and destroy Christians and to suppress the gospel from being spread through the known world, as he's on his way, all of a sudden he hears these words, a bright light appears and he hears a voice and it says, we read there in verse 4, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And look what it says, the Bible says, verse 5, Paul's reaction, Saul said, Who art thou, Lord? The Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks, verse 6. And he, obviously talking about Saul, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee 
what thou must do. Verse 7, And the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. Picture with me this morning, just for a moment, can we go back to this time on the road to Damascus, as here is Saul on his way to persecute Christians, and a bright light comes, so bright, brighter than the sun, it blinds the men that are around him, that are journeying with him. It brings Saul to his knees. The power, the light is just extraordinary, is overwhelming. And Paul, astonished, the Bible says, and trembling with fear, falls to his knees and talks to the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord appeared to Saul. And when Saul encountered the Lord, his life was never the same. So many things changed for Saul. First off, his name became known as Paul, the Apostle Paul, who I just mentioned wrote the majority of Scripture. And you understand this morning, as we look at the testimony, the story of Saul to Paul and his conversion to Christ. And can I click pause for a moment and throw this in there? If you are a saved believer of Jesus Christ, do not be ashamed of your testimony, of your story to come to know Christ. God can use your story and use your mistakes and use your baggage and the things that you were rescued and saved from and came to know Christ, and he can take that story and use that story to influence others with the gospel of Christ. In fact, look at Paul 2,000 plus years ago, and we're still here talking about his testimony of faith. Share your testimony with others. Tell people how the Lord has worked in your life. Do not be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. But you see, going back to the point when we truly encounter the Lord and turn to him, everything changes. One preacher said this, It is absurd to think that a man can believe in Christ with his heart and it not have a radical effect on the rest of his life. I challenge all of us this morning to notice three things in this passage of Scripture that when Paul encountered Christ, many things changed. We're going to look at three real quick this morning. We'll be on our way. Number one, what changed for Paul when he encountered Christ? Number one, his direction changed. His direction changed. Look at Acts chapter 9, verse 5. We just read a moment ago he's on his way to kill Christians. And then he meets with Jesus Christ face to face. And God says, I'm sorry, in verse 6, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. So at one point, here's Paul, Saul. He's going to kill Christians. He encounters the Lord Jesus Christ. And now he has a new direction to go, to find a disciple of Christ in Damascus, not so he can persecute him, but so that he can get a message from the Lord. You see, oftentimes in our culture today, in our society, I fear in my mind and heart this is how we think. We think we're going one way, one direction in life, and we're living our life, and we're, we're enjoying what we want to enjoy, and whether we're living in sin, or we're living in selfishness, or we're living in pride, and we look, oh, Jesus and church, and that's cool, and while I'm going to go this way, I'm just going to... Let open the side door and let Jesus jump in and I'm just going to keep living my life like I am. I'm just going to keep indulging in the same things and keep following the same paths and just keep going the same direction I'm in, but I'm just going to throw Jesus on top of it. I'm just going to sprinkle him and I'm going to include him in it now so that, hey, I go to church now and then or I read my Bible now and then, but I'm going to keep living the same way. Can I encourage you and challenge you this morning when you read Scripture when you truly encounter and put your faith in Jesus Christ, you don't just throw Jesus in the passenger seat and keep going down the road of life. No, Jesus gets in the driver's seat and your direction, which was once going this way, takes a full 180 and goes a total other way. And I think a lot of times we think, oh, I'm just going to throw Jesus on my current life and do what I do always and just sprinkle Jesus on it. No, 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 it's not how it works. You see, when you encounter Jesus Christ, everything changes. Your direction changes. Where you were going, where you were headed, it changes. Yes, in eternity, heaven and hell, but here on earth, your direction changes. 
There's testimonies all throughout this room this morning. Some we'll see at our baptism service who a year and a half, two years ago, were going one direction in their life. We're going one way and fighting fears and fighting anxieties and fighting darkness and sin and selfishness and all those things, but they encounter Jesus Christ. Does that mean all those things were taken away? No, but Jesus was now with them to help them and guide them through this life. And the direction they were going is now going this way. And they're taking the time this afternoon to stand before everyone and say, Listen, I was going this way, but I encountered Christ. And by his faith and love and mercy, I'm going this way. And praise the Lord for his goodness. When we truly encounter the Lord, our direction changes. Have you ever before gotten lost going somewhere? No fun at all. I've been there. The GPS is recalculating or you have no service. That's the worst. And so all of a sudden you're driving and it just disappears. All right, it's no internet connection. Come on, get me back on track. Where am I going here? You're driving around aimlessly. Your wife's not happy. Your baby's screaming in the back seat. I'm not speaking from experience. No fun. I'm old enough to remember when my dad had back in the day the big atlas maps in his car. And he, man, it was like a stack of these yellow maps, and we were going before GPS, and hey, there's highlights of the route and where to go, just to make sure we weren't lost, and we were going the right direction. The point being is that getting lost when you're trying to go somewhere is not fun. But the sad reality is this morning, that is how many people navigate the course and roads of life, lost. Following the wrong directions. Following the directions of this world. Well, uh, a lot of money, that must be the way to go. Success in this world's eyes, that must be the way to go. Seeking fame and self-promotion, that must be the direction I need to head. Seeking fulfillment of our lustful desires and thinking that must be the way that leads me to happiness. But reality is, and we see in our day and age, that you soon realize as you try to chase these things and go a certain direction that you're lost. That there's a void in your heart. That there's a void in your life that you try to fill. But you can't find that peace. You can't find that purpose. You can't find that desire, that satisfaction, that relationship that you were created to have with our Heavenly Father. And you see, when you encounter Christ, you were going one way lost. But as I mentioned, he takes over. He gets in the driving seat. And now you're not going through this life aimlessly and lost without hope because Christ is in the driver's seat. And he's leading you. And he's guiding you. Does that mean trials won't come? No. Does that mean things will be perfect? Of course not. We're in a sin-cursed world. We face things every day. But I'll tell you this much. I'd much rather navigate this life with Jesus Christ in the driver's seat of my life than on my own without Christ. On my own without Christ is hopelessness and darkness, addiction and sin, depression, and avoid when you encounter Christ like Saul did your direction changes believing in Jesus Christ is not continuing to drive around aimlessly lost in this life but now I have Christ and when Christ enters the equation everything changes my marriage changes how I raise my children changes my treatment of other people changes our daily routine in a pursuit of a relationship with Christ changes any category that you want to throw in in this life changes can i encourage you this morning i don't care if this is your first time in the church or you've been going to church for 20 years we need to be striving in our life to go the way that this book teaches only then will you find peace only then will you find fulfillment because by ourselves we are lost we are without hope when paul encountered christ his direction changed I've told the story before. I can give testimony after testimony. I don't want to embarrass people, so I use, I don't know where he is, I use my dad. I've told before. My dad grew up, divorced home, crazy lifestyle, addicted to all kinds of heavy drugs, and man, he can tell you stories and war stories and in and out of prison and should have died two times. Terrible life. Destruction, addiction, drugs, alcohol the chains, the imprisonments of this world, the darkness, all of it on his life, all of it facing. 
met my mom some one day and my mom shared with him as she went to church and said, hey, it's either me and the Lord or you're on your own. My dad found Jesus Christ and was going this way that ultimately was going to lead to a tombstone. But when he found Jesus Christ, his direction changed. He found victory over drugs. He found victory over alcohol. He still battled demons and things. Of course, none of us are perfect, but his direction changed. And praise the Lord this morning that it did, because if it didn't, I would not be standing here before you. The power of Jesus Christ. The power of the Lord Jesus Christ that our direction changes when we encounter him. And you're here this morning and say, I believe in Jesus Christ and I believe in that. But have you truly jumped in and put your faith in him? Because I can assure you, when you do that, your direction will change. What else changed? Real quickly this morning, his direction changed. Number two, his desires changed. His desires changed. Saul's desires changed. You read in verse 27 and 29... Paul desired to persecute and destroy Christianity. But when he encountered Christ on the road that day, his desires changed. And I won't go through all the scripture you can read and study for yourself. But Paul went from someone who was killing Christians and locking them up to when he encountered Christ, his now desire was to spread the gospel through the whole world. To plant churches. To go from city to city and to start churches, his desires, everything that was in him changed because Jesus Christ transformed his life. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, meaning what? If any man really believe and have put their faith in Jesus Christ, the Bible says he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new again it does not mean we'll be perfect but our inner desires will change we'll grow in our faith it's not going to happen just overnight everything is going to change but we're going to take baby steps in the right direction those little boys are not just going to start their life and go buy a house and open a bank account and have the responsibilities of life they need to Grow up in home and in our home and learn and be fed and helped and, and geared and, and grow in their life. And the same is in Christianity. You're a babe in Christ when you first put your faith in Jesus Christ. And you take small steps in the right direction to continually grow and mature in Jesus Christ. And your inner desires start to change. All of a sudden you have this desire to invite people to church. All of a sudden you have this desire to share the gospel with your friends and family and community. All of a sudden, you have this desire to read the Bible, to go to church, to strive to understand what it really means to have a relationship with God. Because I don't know what you've been told and taught before, but I'm here to tell you this morning, as a preacher of the gospel of Jesus Christ, this book is not about rules. This book is about a relationship with Jesus Christ. And when you have that relationship with Christ, everything changes. You have a desire to grow. You have a desire to walk with Jesus Christ. Again, this afternoon, you have a desire, once you put your faith in Christ, to stand before everybody and tell everyone, I put my faith in Christ and I'm following Christ with his help and by his grace, I'm committing myself to Jesus Christ. His desire changed lastly and we're done. What changed for Paul? His direction, his desires. Number three, his destination. His destination changed. Yes, the temporal destination, because he was going somewhere on this, on this world that was not the right way, and the Lord changed it as we talked about. But what ultimately changed for, for Paul was his eternal destination. If you would, real quick with me this morning, turn to Romans, and we'll be done. I want to show you a few verses. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans. Paul's destination changed. You see, the Bible tells us very clearly in Scripture that one day when our time comes to leave this earth, we will either go to one or two places. And the Bible tells us clearly, I don't like to talk about it, but it, it's the truth, and so we can't back down from it. The Bible tells us if we put our faith in Jesus Christ, we'll go to heaven someday. If we've not put our faith in Jesus Christ, 
We've gone, we will go to hell someday, the Bible says. Now, again, I don't like to talk about that, but I don't want to back down from what Scripture says. One pastor or preacher has put it this way. I thought it's a great illustration. It's like going to a doctor and having cancer, and he says, oh, you just have a cold. You can go on your way. No, if I have cancer or something, I want you to tell me what's wrong with me so I can get the proper treatment. And I tell you this morning, not because I love to do it or talk about it, but Scripture clearly teaches that without Jesus Christ, we're on a fast track to hell when this world ends and our life ends. But here's the good news. Look at Romans chapter 3. Paul's destination changed from hell to heaven to eternity with Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 3 verse 10 says this. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. Meaning what? Nobody in this world that ever lived, that is living, that will live is perfect. Nobody. We're all sinners. In fact, look at verse 23. Same chapter. What does it say? For all, Romans 3, 23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Because we've sinned, and you can fill in the blank with whatever sin you want, lie, steal, immorality, we see in our world murder, corruption, pride, selfishness, disobedience to parents, rebellion, all of it, you can throw out, you can fill in the blank. We all have sinned. We all have messed up. We all have done wrong. And God is a holy, perfect God and a just God without sin, the Bible tells us. And because we have sinned, we can't get to God. The Bible says right there, you read it for yourself, for all have sinned, so what? We've come short of God. I can't get to God on my own because I'm a sinner and he's a perfect God. Look at Romans chapter 6, a few pages over. Romans chapter 6. You're in Romans 3. Turn the page or two to Romans 6, 23. So what does that mean, pastor? I've sinned. I've messed up. I've come short of God. So now what? Romans 6 and look at verse 23. The Bible says this. For the wages, that word wages means, pun or means payment, what you deserve. The wages of sin is what is death. Meaning what you and I deserve this morning. I don't care how good of a person you think you are or what your resume is. The bottom line is we are a sinner and we are on a fast track to hell. And because we've rebelled against the holy God and because we've sinned and because we're full of pride and selfishness and rebellion since the Garden of Eden in Genesis, the Bible says that we deserve death. That's the payment that must happen. That is what we deserve. But look at the second part of that verse in Romans 6, 23. It says what? For the wage of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. What's the gift of God? Turn, if you would, lastly, last place we're going to look. The most famous verse, I believe, in the entire Bible in the book of John. John chapter 3. And maybe you've missed your first time in church this morning, but I would... Go out on a limb and say, you've, at one point in your life, you've heard this verse. Romans chapter 3, verse 16. We've sinned. We've messed up. We've come short of God. Because we've come short of God, what do we deserve? We deserve death and hell. That's what we deserve on a holy, just God. There must be a payment. There must be a punishment for our sin. But this morning, can I tell and share with you the good news of John 3, 16 that says what? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. God the Father looked down from heaven, sir, ma'am, teenager, young person, and he saw you and he knew you and he knew you to be born and he loved you so much that even though we're sinners and what we deserve is death and hell, he looked from heaven and said, I don't want them to go through that. I am going to send a substitute to take their place. And that substitute was his son, Jesus Christ, his perfect, innocent son, Jesus Christ, came down the Christmas story in Luke 2 and became a baby and grew up and died a brutal, bloody death on this cross for you and I. I often give this illustration when I share the gospel. You've heard me say it before, but just to wrap our minds around it. 
what Christ did for us. It would be like me here in the state of Connecticut hearing about a man who's on death row because he's been guilty and found guilty of multiple murders. And he's, he, he's now he, he's received the death penalty and or we can argue, go back and forth about it, but most people say rightfully so. He took life and now the state's going to take his life. And I get wind of this news and I walk into the courtroom before they drag him out on his last day and I say, listen, I don't know that man. I've never talked to him. I've never met him, but I love him. And I don't want to see him die. I don't want to see him receive the death penalty. Well, sir, someone's got to have the payment. Someone must take the punishment for him. And I say, okay, well, I have a three-month-old little boy who's innocent, who's in every sense perfect. And I'll give him to the state so that that man can walk free. You say, oh, pastor, that's crazy. Nobody would ever do that, right? Nobody would in their right mind. But do you understand this morning that is what God did for you and for me? We deserve death. We deserve hell. We're all sinners. But he sent an innocent son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross. And he died on the cross and he hung there that day. And the whips and the thorns and the blood and all the things of that brutal death. And he carried on him the weight and the sin and the darkness and the corruption of this world. And all the times that people take his name in vain. And all the times people joke and mock the word of God. And all the times we, leave, we lie and steal and cheat, all of it, he took it on his shoulders that day. And he had you in his heart and his mind. He said, I don't want to see them die and go to hell. I'm going to take their place for them. He died on the cross and praised the Lord. We read scripture three days later on Easter Sunday. He rose again. And he ascended to heaven to live on the, sit on the right hand of his father, and one day God will come back and take his believers home. But here's the message. Here's why God put a desire in us to plant this church 16 months ago. Here's what we've sold our life out to. is not to make a name for me. is not to make a name for New Heights Baptist Church. But is to share this good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ with everyone that we can. Because it will transform you. It will change you. Your direction will change. Your desires will change. Your destination for eternity one day will change. Bound for hell. Bound for eternal damnation. But now one day I can sit here and I can stand before you with confidence and say, I don't fear death because I know whenever it comes, I'm going to be in heaven with my heavenly father. Because as a 15-year-old boy on April 13, 2007, I bowed my head and asked the Lord Jesus Christ to come into my heart and to save me. And my life was forever changed. And I encourage you this morning, if you've never made that decision, if you've never put your faith in Jesus Christ, to do so this morning. It is the most important decision you will ever make. In a few moments, we're going to go down here at the field and we're going to see people get baptized. And what is baptism? Baptism doesn't save us. Baptism doesn't get us to heaven. Baptism is a symbol that these Believers this morning want to share with the world that I made that decision. I put my faith in Jesus Christ. And by the way, be sure of it. Don't just, I, I believe that, Pastor. Be sure of it. You know what I love about Saul's testimony when he's giving it in Acts chapter 9? He remembers the time. He remembers the place. He remembers what happened. And he can tell it clear as day. If there's any doubt in your mind and heart this morning, oh, please be sure. Please be sure that you've asked Jesus Christ to come into your life and to save you. Romans 10, 13, and I'm all done, says this. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Whosoever. I don't care who you are this morning. I don't care what neighborhood you live in. I don't care the balance in your bank account. I don't care your baggage, your background, what you're facing this morning. I don't care about any of it because the Bible says, for whosoever. For whosoever, for whosoever with a humble heart will say, God, I know I'm a sinner, and I know I deserve death and hell, but I thank you for sending your son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross and to take my punishment, and thank you that he rose again, and thank you that he's in heaven, and this morning, God, I'm putting my faith in you. 
I'm asking you to come into my heart and to save me and to transform me and to change my life and to change my direction and my desires and ultimately one day my destination. Oh, sir, ma'am, please be sure. Be sure. There's an old hymn I love. We sing it here sometimes. It says these words. Oh, soul, are you weary and troubled? No light in the darkness you see. There's light for a look at the Savior, life more abundant and free. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth, they'll grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. His word shall not fail you, he promised. Believe him and all will be well. Then go to a world that is dying, his perfect salvation to tell. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will go strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. If you're here this morning, and you've never turned your eyes to Jesus Christ and put your faith in him, I urge you don't leave this morning without making that decision. And if you're here this morning, you have, and maybe you've gotten a little off track. Maybe it's your first time in church in a long time. You haven't opened your Bible and you don't know how long and you're going through some things that are discouraging. Why don't you get back on track this morning? Why don't you recommit to Jesus Christ?